up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Mop. This is the Elder Scrolls Podcast. I'm Scott, here with Michael and Drew, and today we are talking all about the Dramora, the Lesser Daedra, but also we're going to be talking about the Zivili and the Zivkin, which is sort of like a hybrid race, but we'll get into that. But first, we're going to start with the Dramora. Which one of you guys would like to take it away? Well, I draw just Drew in the house. All right, I'll take the reins. I'll, I'll keep it nice and simple, but take the horns. Dramora... Dramora are, you know, we've all, we all know what they look like, the kind of devilish looking Daedra, the, the, the typical Daedra that you associate with the Daedra, that's the Dramora. And the Dramora are, are kind of unique in terms of Daedric races because for the most part, and this applies to the Zivili and the Zivkin as well, is they're a lot more intelligent than most Daedric races. So while, you know, a, a lot of Daedric creatures, they're just, you know, they're naturally chaotic and they don't really have organization or anything like this the dramora tend to organize themselves and it's it's something kind of fundamental whereas you know for for a mortal you're born into a family you're often but you know you have a racial identity you have your family you have your you know the lord or king or whatever who's it's kind of you know there's there's a natural hierarchy in place whereas for Daedra, you know, you you come, you go, your vessel, your vassal goes to the void, and you kind of spring back into one of the realms of one of the princes, usually based on their whims, and you, you don't really have anything. You don't have parents. Um, so basically, Dramora have kind of in, instilled this themselves. They've developed their own clan and caste systems as a way to kind of have some camaraderie and companionship, as well as mm. rules and and you know. Um, reasons to live a structured life which is kind of bizarre for Deidre. i like to think about them in the same as we discussed in the mazkin oriel podcast um how like the mazkin as said by haskell like oh this proud race and they're sort of like this kind of it's easier i think to think about oblivion and the lesser daedra less in terms of oh who do they belong to or which Daedra created them rather they are just all of these races whether that be scamps clan fears you know zivili or dramora or mazkin um that are spread throughout the different planes of oblivion and find their own allegiances mm -hmm. in the same way that you would have say nords or something or the races of men that have spread out and found their different allegiances and, and, and stuff like that yeah it is it is a really cool race considering that as far as daedra go like drew was saying not many of them are particularly uh, sentient in the way that mortals are, you know, in the, in the way that they act. There are some examples, but generally speaking, like the Dromora view them as kind of below them and, and mindless beasts, you know, this other Daedra. They're the high-class Daedra. We call them lesser Daedra, but they're kind of just second to Daedric princes in terms of, like, their power level and their kind of brain power, for mm. lack of better words. Yeah. You know how a clan fear kind of acts like just a, a beast. You could say that mm. most Daedra are sentient, but they're not sapient. They're not like experiencing yeah. mortal emotions the way the Dramora do. And and the fact that, you know, you, you hear from Dramora themselves saying, you know, we have the capacity to feel fear and shame. Um, so it makes sense that they kind of um, give themselves a purpose in life and a way to display their strength by coming up with these these hierarchical systems. Yeah, and they, and they certainly must enjoy a lot of the kind of horrible displays and actions that they do. As much as they also kind of, it's been said that they don't really have like a good and evil, it just simply is. And they're very oaths oriented and mm. duty oriented. And they have kind of like a, you know, this is what I said I'm going to do, so I'm going to do it kind of but attitude. And, and they also get respect for adhering to their because they live forever too adhering to their oaths and their promises gives them a great respect because it's seen as this you know extremely difficult task because it's not like oh i have to agree um to this for a mortal lifespan or for a year or some deal or something it's forever depending on the on the oath yeah it's interesting that they they are kind of like just like there's a, there's a sense of chivalry almost and sort of like the honest sense, I get this kind of idea of this band of traveling knights and then they find a lord to serve and then they're like, okay, we're going to sort, maybe even summarize a better um, description, but then they're going to serve that lord or whatever, whether that be a Daedric prince or a powerful mage or something that has summoned them. And, and you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, I do like that sort of aspect because in, in ways you can kind of think about like, oh, I'm, I'm if you're trying to control an Atronarch or, or a clan fear, it's like they might like, you know, try and they all might go nuts and try and attack you and kill you or reject your control whereas it kind of seems a little bit more like transactional like here you've hired the mercenaries and we will honor our our contract or it, or 
debt. It does or depend it though, because Dramora are known to, you know, considering that they have their rank systems and that they're kind of high, hold themselves in high esteem, right? Mm. Uh, summoning them can be the ultimate act of offense. They have to do what you say, but they would absolutely yeah. hate it, you know, if there's some esteemed high ranking Dramora and then you're like, you know what? You're now a Dramora butler. Congratulations. Like, so, yeah, yeah, it would See, that's absolutely the torment them. And there is a story. Sorry, I'll just say yeah, um, Darkest Darkness, I believe, is the story. Hmm. Oh, no, it's a tragedy in black. I knew it yeah. had something to do with yeah. dark. A tragedy in black. And I, it kind of is just a narrative, but it, it's basically the story of a Dramora who's summoned and asked um, how to make a magic dress needed for a birthday. And the Dramora ends up saying, oh, you need a soul gem. And then says, oh, I've got a soul gem. Here you go. And that actually, according to this little tale, allows the Dramora to break free and betray the person and kill them and put their soul into this black soul gem. Because you're never meant to take a free gift from a summoned Dramora. It says it breaks the conjuration, freeing the summoned from the summoner. And, and again, this... We don't know how true this is because it reads like a, a story more, but it is quite interesting still. Once again, there's going to be that like personal, like individuality, like differences. But like, I like that there's an example in Morrowind of where there's the Dramora. It's like a, it's kind of, I'm pretty sure, I can't remember if it's a big piece of media or rock, but basically a, a tribunal sort of site. They kind of like employed by the tribunal temple to protect some sites and so on. There's even one which you can kind of, harass over and over and over and then basically he threatens to kill you and he actually does attack you and he says he's going to essentially defile your corpse yep. and so on in a very rough manner but yeah it, it's interesting so i think one of the reasons why they're you know despite being the the kind of race that is very is very keen to honor um their place um the reason they're still so dangerous to summon is because i i think they're much more likely to to kind of answer to fellow Daedra rather than to mortals. Because if you think about it, you know, the benefit of being a mortal, even though you have a, a finite lifespan, is that you're, you know, you're born into that, you're having a family, you've got an afterlife to look forward to, all of this stuff. Whereas for a Dramora, you can die and die and be reborn and keep coming back, learn from your mistakes. And and, and you, as a result, you just get stronger and stronger and you earn a better place. And then you've got some random snot-nosed magician who summons you. And, you know, so I feel like if, if a mortal is going to summon a Dramora, they have to really be powerful enough to impress this Dramora and, and feel like they're in a either peers or on a higher level. Uh, well, that's... the. I was just going to say, that's the simple reason why in gameplay mechanics that Dramora Lords are like an expert mm. or like higher level spell and you have more simple kind of ones as lower level spells because it's your ability to actually exercise your will over them. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the other thing is when, when, you, when you do summon a Dramora, you could almost view it as they are bound by the oath of being summoned so long as your spell and your knowledge of conjuration is good enough to keep them bound to it. But you could almost look at them as like a shifty lawyer. Like if they can find a loophole to whatever covenant they're bound by so that they can betray you and you don't have the knowledge of how they can do that, they probably will. Because technically, if they're not, you know, technically breaking their agreement, then they're not doing any wrong. You know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with their actions. It's the agreement if they can somehow break free of it. And and that's the thing is they're, they're staunchly loyal to their clans. So, you know, if... It, they may be the most honorable, I'll say person for lack of a better term, they may be the most honorable person amongst their clan. But if you force them to serve some random person who's got, you know, who, who has nothing to do with their allegiances, that loyalty isn't there. You know, if anything, you're, you're betraying them by forcing this on them. So they're going to want to, you know, backstab you at any turn despite being loyal creatures. It, it is. It does get a bit confusing. You could imagine... You know, how many oaths and agreements you can accept over the course of a immortal lifespan. Mm. I can imagine there'd be a lot of crossover and confusion because, you know, you're sworn to this Daedric Prince to help him and never go against his goals, but then also to this wizard and to not go against his goals. But then if the wizard's goals and the Daedric Prince's goals go against each other, who are you helping? You know, it can it can all get a little bit messy. Mm. Yeah, there there is a um I'm just trying to find the exact uh quote, but it was basically um 
It was something. It was it's something along the lines of basically that Obl oblivion is ever changing, but the oaths held by Dramora are eternal. And so that's kind of a, like you know what you're just talking about. It's interesting that you know how many oaths and stuff they could. But then again, I feel like an oath can be fulfilled as well. Like it doesn't necessarily mean an eternity full of like an ever growing list of oaths. Like it could be like fulfill an oath. You know what I mean? Like any other contract. Yeah, complete or this until task, this time. and then they do it. Yeah. yeah. But you know, while Dramora, which we'll talk about in a, a, a different um, lesser Daedra soon, that they're not necessarily the most powerful Daedra, but their ability to be loyal and organized is incredibly valuable, especially to princes like Merun's Dagon, who, um, you know, they're very closely associated. Because you can imagine when something like the Oblivion Crisis happens, obviously a big part of the the um, the invasion is just unleashing chaos, but just sending out ran like you know hordes of really unorganized daedra that can't really think properly um isn't really going to win um a, a grand scale war whereas having these really well organized troops is a great way to to make a revolution happen or to to win a war i mean you look at what dagon did in battle spy you know when we were talking about the mazkin mm. in a different podcast and how they've been seen in the service of many daedric princes as have Dramora, but it seems like they defected from Nocturnal's ranks. Whereas mm. I don't know if that would happen with Dramora, or at least it would be a lot more difficult or less likely to happen due to their loyalty, making them quite reliable. Mm. Well, let's have a quick um, talk about, before we move on, their, um, their Dramora, the hierarchy, basically. So, so there's eight ranks that we know about, and you start off first with the Varlets, which are basically the dregs, and then the lowest of the low, and they're just so the bottom of the cast. And but then even if you think about above them are the curls, and they're supposed to be like a disorganized group of rabble. They just they're just a bigger bulk of the clan's fighting force, but they're not like the trained warriors like you were just talking about. But then you start getting to the caitiffs and the kinval, and they're sort of you know as you as you go up the rank, they start becoming more organized, better warriors, and so on. And then you sort of start getting into what they call a um, a kindreve, which is like an officer or, or sheriff in translation. And then, uh, oh, sorry, it would be kinreve, I guess, because they kind of use yeah. like kin, yeah, kinreve, kin, and then kin marcher, which is sort of like lord. So I guess that's kind of what you're getting the dramora lords is is technically a kin marcher but obviously you know gameplay names and stuff um then the marquinez which is a grand duke um which this is all rough like daedric translations um and then on top of that there's the valkanez which is like described as a warrior duke and we do hear about it's i like the term like duke because we hear that quite a bit in uh in reference to the daedra we do hear some like there's a duke of scamps in the um I'm pretty sure it's in the 36 lessons of Vivek and and stuff like that. I do. And, I and just the do Dukes like of Shivering Isles and yeah, exactly and, and things yeah. like that. They they are cool titles. I will say we do actually see again. We say Dramora Lords in Skyrim. You said with the kin marchers, but they do have yeah, the titles Markanaz and Valkanaz. Well, Skyrim. you know, a lord. It, if you look at it as kind of a mimicry of of the real world or or of the mortal realm, it's like any any land owning role. So a duke owns land so they're a lord as well like you know that that's that's kind of the weird thing about it is the title duke or um count or any of these lordly terms it's like doesn't actually make sense unless you have a barony or a duchy or whatever but i most of the i imagine most of these um officers unless they actually are given sections of land in the prince's realm they're not technically lords but it's just a title i guess it depends mm. But, but yeah. yeah, you do get to see them in um, Skyrim, but they are just the different kind of ranks for how strong you're... Um, like when you're summoning and stuff, there's... Mm -hmm. I know there's the Dramora Markanaz and the Valinaz. I'm just trying to think. Hold on. Uh, hold on, hold on. Will it summon a different ranked one? Or am I thinking, ah, oh, I may have this confused. I may be thinking of just from the Dead Thralls perspective. Because I was doing oh. tons of testing on what's the strongest dead thrall for that video. Highly recommend you check that out. And mm. um, I was testing the Dramora to see if they were powerful. Yeah. So you may be correct in saying that the Dramora Lord you summon from Oblivion is a kin marcher. Yeah. Um, 
Also, just to throw out some interesting facts, obviously, like, we, you sort of will associate, like, Dramora with, like, the kind of darker-skinned ones that you'll see with the demonic-y sort of tattoo stuff. But in Battlespire and Daggerfall, they did kind of have a closer to sort of human-like skin and what you would also compare to the Scarfen, which is another group of intelligent Daedra. Um, it's kind of just interesting to... You, we could always, like, speculate, I guess, on their, like, common ancestry because... In the same way, we'll, we will sort of get to with the Zivoli and the Dramora and the Scarf, and they're basically all like little horned demons, like it's not necessarily little, but like um, sentient horned demons. So I wonder if there is any sort of um, common ends. We have no idea of knowing, and really, so I guess it's, it, it's <laughs> worth noting that their horns are like their balls, too. If you've, if you've, if you're like a weak of fortitude, you've got no horns. That's kind of yeah. the way the Dramora see it. I don't mean. In other ways, like their balls, just in that way. <laughs> Actually, in the legends, in the legends uh, depiction, we do get some Dramora that are like um, lighter skinned, like that more orange. You thing. do see some like that in the Elder Scrolls Online as well. Yeah, oh, they yeah. seem to. That's they right. do seem to vary depending on what realm they dwell in um, and who they yeah. serve. You know, like it's it's kind of a it's commonly seen the difference between Cold Harbor and Molag Val's realm and. Dagon and the Deadlands is red versus blue. It's kind of like just the the tint to either their skin or, you know, tattoos or their horns and things like that. Yeah. So I was going to... Um, just one little thing I haven't thought about. Um, the actual name, Dramora. Um, is Mora... Mora, like, you know, Hermaeus. Mm. Right. Uh, um, is isn't isn't Mora translate to wood or something like that? Um, hold on, what's the what's the uh, at Mora name? Did they call it? Because basically, uh, oh they, yeah, I think Alt, at, Alt Mora means elder wood, and yeah, Alt means so Mora yeah. is like wood in the same way that Molag is fire and Baal is stone. Yeah, so Molag Baal really means fire stone in Daedric, but at Mora wood, it's just. I don't know what, what what how you could extrapolate and think about that more, but that's why Hermes Mora gets called the Woodland mm. Man by a bunch of um, other groups. But so I don't I don't know how you you could spin that. But Dramora, like Mora, so whatever Dre means, De Doctor Dre plus Wood, <laughs> <laughs> and then you get like Dramora. Yeah, that's something but, that's something to think about actually, because there's there's probably some connection there. Um, unless it's just yeah. completely coincidental. <laughs> but they... I mean, it's just a cool sounding name too, but they do have like, you know, I I'm sure you could work something out. I don't know. Maybe there there is as many Dramora as there are like trees in Tamriel. Mm. Hence the call. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but still, it's interesting to look at a little bit of the Daedric language. Yeah. I mean, is it, we, we'll probably speak more about the Dramora, but should we talk a little bit about the Zivali and what they're like? Yeah, let's let's go to the Zivoli first, and then we can talk uh, about the the, the Zivoli, uh, highly intelligent Daedra that I found for many years as a child hard to pronounce the name of. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I don't even know it. if I'm getting it right. To be honest, I'm just we called it Zivali th when I was uh, really young. Exivali was when I was a kid. I used to say Exivali, yeah. but I, I believe I have heard an NPC in the Elder Scrolls Online say Zivoli. So, and I think Zivoli is phonetically it, it's it's yeah. yeah. And it's pretty cool. It's it's cool sounding once you get used to it. Yeah. If you but yeah. So so these ones are of great like power. They're like your brutes, you know. They're they're very muscly. Um, but they are also highly intelligent, more so than the Dramora even. They're... Yes, but they are liable to disloyalty and betrayal. Mm -hmm. So they despise they they being haven't been treated. Properly. Yeah, they despise being subordinated in any way. They're very individualistic for a lot. You know, for the most part, at least from the other races and. Um, which is something huge that separates them from the Dramora, because I'd say they're stronger than the Dramora, at least physically, but they're not really as um, as well adjusted to serving in an organized army or something like that. Yeah, because the way it works with Dramora is you're sub you're just subservient to the rank above you, mm -hmm. and you can almost just like pick on the one below you. And if someone in a rank above you is picking on you, you just deal with it. That's just your position. You know, it's it's not mm. questioned. Yeah. It, it's it, it's interesting. It, you know, you always got to think, again, that they're, they're individualistic and more so than others, the, the Zivoli. Because in the same way, there's nothing really that 
distinguishes them from a Daedric Prince outside of their power level and obviously that they've got like a, they, you know, sort of tend towards a sim, like a Zivoli form. But um, yeah, having them being so individualistic, it, it does make it a bit more interesting because o- o- often when you think of Daedra, Daedra, lesser Daedra at least, you always sort of think in terms of subservience to a to a greater prince or something. You don't really, and, and to be honest, that's what you see most of the time. You see the Oriel Mazkin, they're all serving Sheagorath. You see the Dromora and all of these other Daedra in Mehrin's Dagon's armies or Merlag Bell's armies. So you're always thinking about it. It's like, oh, here's my little demon minions. But, you know, in reality, like you could have, a, it, it's cool. There, there could be a lot more individuality, but it's also cool to actually see a race that, I mean, yes, they have, been seen to serve more like Powell and, and mm. Dagon and stuff, but they, yeah, they so do have more individuality. Yeah, they'd yeah. be more, much more prone to desert if they're not getting the respect they deserve, or you know mm. anything like this. Whereas you know when we talk about the Zivkin, it, it's kind of the the perfect answer to this. You know, Molag Bal seeing the the virtues of the Dramora and the strength of the the Zivali and wanting to combine those those elements. So that you can have a race that are as you know powerful and and um, imposing as the Zivolite, with the ability to kind of take orders and be very loyal and die for you um, of the Dramora. Yeah, th- I remember. That's the thing. I remember- Sorry, you go. I was just saying. I remember the first time ever seeing a Zivolai in um, Gaia Lata in Oblivion, um, when in like around the torture realms. Like I just remember thinking it was like the coolest thing because it's you know when you you know a kid too i really just like oh demon that's epic or you're fighting all of these demon dramora and now there's this big muscular one it was like Mm. pretty intimidating for a little 11 year old me yeah and i can i can really imagine them flying through the air you know how in oblivion everything had this like floating physics to it like i remember doing a spinning (laughs) two-handed backwards attack which is like looks kind of funny in retrospect but you basically just like push them really hard after spinning around with the end of your two-handed weapon like even if it's a warhammer and they go flying through the air with this big kind of flop motion (laughs) but but anyway about zivoli i will say there's this little bit here that says they have a complicated relationship with the dramora finding them to be extreme in their behavior and even ostentatious and that they're kind of like pompous and that they have this unwarranted uh conceit Mm. Whereas mm. Ziv- you know, Zivali are seen to be more rogue. Just just in general, they they have way more like goals of their own. Well, one tiny I don't, I don't know if this bit is just based on on the fact about this like the Zivali twins, but the idea that there are Zivali that do actually like work to ke- gather in pairs and stuff. So it's kind of like kind of seeming like instead of like a big clan based system they sort of focus like a more uh, a singular relationship or something with another one who has common goals or common interests or so on so a bunch of best friends instead of this big open hierarchy kind of thing but that might also just be based as conjecture based on the fact that in ESO there's some Zivoli twins, but... <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the Dramora are naturally going to kind of, you know, not not particularly like the Zivoli because, you know, they're, they're big and strong and they also kind of just shun a lot of these essential values that the Dramora hold dear, you know, so it's like they can slot themselves really higher up in, high up in the hierarchy if they wanted, but they'll never really think about anyone, you know, so even if they were above most Dramora ranks, they probably wouldn't treat anyone below them with, you know like properly e- even even though they're higher ranking you still have to you know treat your um inferiors with respect you know uh, um, i feel like i feel like we need one of the those memes like the chad zivoli <laughs> yeah <laughs> and put put the dramora next to it the virgin with, with the head down and it's like must obey all commands <laughs> <laughs> I, I i did i did find i did find the talos Riemann one for the podcast so i've got that in there <laughs> right, <laughs> right. The but um it's interesting that, and this is probably, this could just be due to evolving lore, but there was a, like, clan, like, clans of Zivoli in Battlespire. Mm. I have a feeling it really is they've just gone in different directions with the lore, so I don't know how much you want to talk about that, or or maybe they've even culturally changed in time, and now they've sort of, you know, there's less clans or something, or maybe there's some clans and there's some more individualistic types, but they were led by a, a moth. And uh, I, I don't. Uh, I always read that as Moath. Moath, <laughs> yeah. Or oh, well, Moath, like, yeah. yeah. Moath sounds funny, but I don't know. It could be. But regard, regardless, it's just uh, you know an interesting. I, I I don't think 
you should think too much into that, honestly. I think with all future law, they're going to go with the individualistic angle. But, but and... hear this, it doesn't really break out from the individualistic angle. I mean, you could say the human race is quite individualistic, especially in the modern era. But of course, there are times when we, in our own individuality, elect to become part of a group for some cause. You know, there's and, and have yeah, a sense but I think of... people would... Wouldn't people, I think people would say that as the argument, it's because we're like communal social creatures is why we feel the need to become part of some community. Sure, or but Zivolai also have goals. So if it's in their interest yeah. to come together yeah, yeah. To, to help a larger cause that they'll all benefit from or all enjoy, you can easily, mm. w- what I'm saying is it can make sense. It's not like, oh, is it this law or this law? It's like, it's both. Oh yeah, I just mm. I just imagine going forward. I, I I highly doubt they will mention clans and stuff. It seems like a relic mm. of the Daggerfall stuff, as is the case with a lot of things. Like any all Battle Spire sort of Daggerfall era, there's going to be oh, some especially differences Daggerfall. in law. Yeah, there's going to be some big differences. And so that's the the main thing with the Zivkin, you know, created by Molag Bal, is that they pretty much just are a combination of these two types of daedra you know e- even in appearance they 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 look like bigger stronger um dramora and they're very heavily like themed around the kind of pale blue of cold harbor and you know they it says that they're extremely loyal to their dark lord molag bal have so, you, you know, seen the the zivkin concept art it looks really really cool oh yeah like, just it's, seen it's it very it's very high fantasy kind of stuff but it's like it's pretty cool. Mm. Mm. And they're made in the uh, the vile laboratory mm. in Cold Harbor, mm-hmm. the evil place. It's the same yeah. place where the uh, is it called the the Daedric Titan, the the, yeah. the dragon turned the dragon. into a Daedra. So Molag Bal's done a few of these kind of like corrupting experiments. He likes his laboratories, doesn't he? Mm. I mean, like like I like I talked about in the Magic podcast, you make a flesh atronarch in a lab as well you know yeah i don't know i wish you <laughs> i know <laughs> it's a bit spooky it. spooky there's skeletons, a bit of isn't it? There's, there's a little yeah there's a little bit of more like bell sort of like i i know he's all about domination and stuff so so the the principle of of the whole like plane meld makes sense but the way it was written I, I don't know i feel like he's just become a little bit sometimes he becomes a bit more of a uh catch all evil baddie rather than a sort of more nuanced sort of look at things like the you know what i mean he mm. kind of just ends up being like i, I now i'm just turning making all of these corrupted extra daedra and, and i've got uh, torture like to... quotas that need to be carried out and things like this yeah. but what you know what um way would you have him fleshed out let's say molag bow is going to appear in elder scroll 6 what part of his realm other than well, pure domination would you like to see kind of have some more nuance it's not it? so much the realm i just mean like rather honing in on the things that he's known for sorry the, i meant corruption. sphere i meant sphere of domination well yeah i mean honing in on the corruption and domination more so than the sort of i'm just going to like evil armies and make these evil experiments and stuff for example like i really really like his connection obviously with the vampires and stuff a really cool story behind that but also how in dunma mythology he's credited he, he's he's one of the headquarters of the house of troubles and he is always said to be ruining um trying to ruin dunmary purity mm. of their clans and houses and stuff so i think like you know imagine you try to ruin the purity purity of the of the dragon blood or something or you're doing like all of these scheming and and just a sort of different way and also i do like the outright domination but i just feel like sometimes it's like oh Mm. i'm going to make some monsters in a laboratory here they come and it's like it's all right it's just not no that the best interpretation of him or or execution i guess that is cool i mean the thing is they did choose to make him the cornerstone of the entire plot so you're gonna have to focus on those elements a bit but you know, if there was a Elder Scrolls Six, I mean, of course there will be a quest for Molag Bow. I hope so. They better have a quest mm. for every Daedric Prince. It- well, it's funny that will be the first game where they start like they can reference the plane mm. meld in retrospect in a mainline the- Elder Scrolls game. Yeah, but that just makes me. I just don't want it to be have anything to do with that or be anything like that. I really, I yeah. really hope, like you're saying, it does focus on something a bit more unique. And I'm really keen to see another one of the Daedric princes take the spotlight that we haven't seen with huge presence yeah. before. You know, e- even if it's not a main thing, having Periite involved, even as a DLC expansion or just something more, would be really cool. 
and I wouldn't be surprised if you know we we've got stories of Dramora being in, mostly in service to Mayrune's Dagon, Molag Bal. You see some instances with uh, Boethia, but um, if we end up fleshing out other Daedric princes, most princes are going to see value in an, in a highly intelligent race of Daedra who will serve them you know really well so you know and and as you said with perry is uh you know the taskmaster he's gonna have lots of lots of uh daedra to help him lots of dramora butlers something mm. to think about too but interesting about like i was just thinking because you know sanguine himself yeah. presents himself mm. in skyrim as a dramora but you can also imagine that the dramora have taken on roles as like pirates and like and as you know you, you can summon a merchant or a butler but you know expand that to think about like maybe some of sanguine's rooms or or stuff like that they've got this sort of civilization or like taverns and mm. stuff and there's dramora butlers and stuff around like fulfilling other roles and it would be interesting i guess to see their like like maybe their clans, like there's a clan of Dramora, like hospi you know, hospitality related Dramora <laughs> that are all so into service in that way rather than, than battle and their honor in, their, in performing their tasks and stuff like that. It, it could be a cool thing to see, especially under the service of other, like, you know, you could write a whole history about like, oh, this clan of them are in service to Sanguine for, for this or whatever. And they're all like, you know, yeah. serving beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so rather than great warriors, you have like great chefs or whatever. And you've got the Gordon yeah. Ramsay of Dramora and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> it could be cool. Although at least from Hell's what we- Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> from, <laughs> from what we know about them so far, they do seem to have a culture that kind of revolves around preparing for battle and war and training. And each time they die, you know, they've got the experience of the battle that killed them to learn from and continue on and be a better fighter. And, you know, at least mm. it seems they make their own weapons and armor, um, this Daedric kind of stuff. Although it is interesting, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's just a leveling thing in Oblivion, but you can get a weaker version where it's just called like Dromora Mace, but it looks exactly like Daedric and it's just weaker yeah. than Daedric. Yeah, so there's all of the Dramora series of weapons. They look exactly like Daedric, but the re only reason they're called Dramora this is so that they're not as powerful as the Daedric weapons that you get later. So you're not just coming up against yeah. all these people with super powerful weapons, yeah. nor are you able to just get them at level and one. And you or can't two. take their armor, which is interesting. You know, it almost yeah. looks like it's molded to their skin. Mm. Yeah, yeah. They just molded to their skin. Convenient, convenient way to have the player not be able to get a full set of Daedric <laughs> early on. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it it is a cool um a cool uh cool group of cool dudes. <laughs> I'm, 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 trying to find, I'm trying to find this compelling <laughs> podcast <laughs> points. I'm trying to find this section, although I can't now source it anywhere, but I remember hearing something about aesthetic refinement. I'm just right. mm. let me mm. ha have a look. But yeah, I, I definitely think You think they're cool. We will do <laughs> we are cool. They are really cool. We're definitely going to see them in um, Elder Scrolls Six for sure. But I, I think they, it would be cool to see some of the because everyone actually talks a lot about the exploration of Daedra, as in the Daedric princes. It would be really cool to expand that, and a good way to expand exploration of them is through the Lesser Daedra and the societies that serve them. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, like with the Dramora clan of, of, you know, chefs <laughs> or whatever, or whatever, something like that. But in the same way, you could do it like. You know, imagine if you see meet the Duke of Scamps mm. and he's got his scamp and stuff like it. Maybe some of the other Daedra elements could go on there, like a bit more exposure to um, lesser Daedras that have personalities mm. and that you actually come into conflict I did, with. I did find the source, boys. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Dramora clan uh, involved with Battle Spire. And it says, uh, the clan is based in Havoc Wellhead. It represents the principle of destruction as evolution, aspiring to arts and powers of ever-increasing potency and aesthetic refinement. Right. Mm. And there's a picture right. of Imago Storm with a really cool armor. Very shiny well, looking. I was going to throw out, since since we're actually on a, on a touch, um, since there's not even that much on... The Scarfen, we could also just talk about the Scarfen because they are the other intelligent group of um, horned Dramora kind of humanoids. And I wonder if there's probably some cross-pollination every now and then, but um, they are they are known as the uh, the Dramora of the Fields of Regret. And basically this is what, um, Cla that's Clavicus Vile's realm and Clavicus Vile presents himself as a Scarfen-like character a lot of the time and barbus does too in in uh, the elder scrolls online i believe 
<laughs> yeah appears, appears as a scarf then yeah um i can't i can't yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. there we go yeah because he he's because that's the thing is funny that barbas is associated as the hound and most represented as the hound but he's appeared as a scamp as well as so a scamp scarf and and um and uh yeah, <laughs> well, and, and you'll remember when we were talking about her scene, you know, her scene's got his herns, the, the you know, a horned form of Daedra. And we were talking about how there's some connection between um, Dagon and her scene and perhaps Clavicus Vile as well. And there are oh, yeah, with, but, similarities. Yeah, just so, yeah, for like clarification, that was a quote from a developer, yeah. Gary Noonan. So it's it's the kind of thing you can take with. It's not yeah. canonized, but take it with a, you know, the, the ideas behind it. They're like, oh, there know, are possible connections this. to be drawn from and, you know, used yeah. in the Elder Scrolls 6. Well, the, the Scarfen also do have some kind of caste system, too. Like there is a mm. there is a sense of hierarchy there. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there is a relation because they are similar to them in some aspects. It's not as simple as, oh, they also have horns. Yeah, I, I imagine them being quite the like. I mean, that's probably to be honest, Scarf and probably more so fit what I was talking about with like Sanguine's realm of like yeah. chefs and yeah. and things like I that. Like so. Scarf and probably fit the bill better. I think Dramora would be cooking up a some kind of torture torture kitchen before they'd be making some delicious food. <laughs> yeah, we've got like so. There's Hearns as well, like you said. But what other besides Maskin and Oriel? Are there any other off the top of your head, can you remember any other like sort of intelligent Daedra? Ones that kind of classify more like a similar to a mortal race rather than than like a scamp or something. Though, you know, that's the thing. Scamps and stuff and Frost Atronarchs and Winged Twilights have said to like speak before. Even they look more bestial. Like they still, a lot of them can be, can have intelligence. It seems like the with the Atronarchs, if I'm remembering correctly, is they kind of can almost become a bit of a hive mind. They have these weird realms that are just, you know, for example, the the Flame Atronarchs, I can't remember the name of the realm, but it's just endless fire and they're all virtually identical. I think it's actually a, a Dramora who's talking about it and how mundane he finds Atronarchs. Mm. Um, but, you know, you've got things like, um, yeah, like Nocturnals and, and Shrikes, which Shrikes, I guess, is just... Oh, yeah, too, the yeah. Nocturnal Shrikes. And, and Mephala's, to... um, like, Spider Daedra seem to kind of talk. Yeah, they talk but... a bit. I think. Yeah, and you can imagine it easily because they've got the humanoid yeah. upper body. You can imagine it. But yeah. There's also the Knights of Order, but they're like mindless beasts, aren't they? As much as they have a humanoid form, they're kind of just yeah. these order keeping. Kind of off topic, but just because you've mentioned them, I want to mention there's such a cool. I was posting it on Twitter, but the Shivering Isles concept art for them so the the original like concept art for a bunch of the shivering isle stuff it's so cool but the knights of order instead of the like white crystalline look it was more like a robot like a clockworky sort of robot thing it was all like a silvery sort of color oh i found it, it. it that's so cool mm. yeah it was really cool like a lot of the shivering isles concept stuff i'm sort of wish like oh man if they executed it like that it was so much crazier and cooler and you but yeah much more alien yeah. feeling also i, I yeah. imagine seekers are probably somewhat intelligent too yeah i i feel like we're just ending up well, you just end up blurring the lines <laughs> yeah. because they're pretty much they, there is more intelligence to because even like you know it i guess i wouldn't expect a clan fear to talk yeah mm -hmm. for example yeah. but anything with a somewhat humanoidish face like even like a scamp or a wing twilight like it's kind of like depends. yeah they just don't the... seem as individualistic as dramora and zivali tend to be in terms of like you know uh, that very mortal thought process. They seem more singular in in their purpose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I but, guess um, I guess that wraps up the Dramora podcast. I kind of mm -hmm. had a feeling it wouldn't be as long as some of the other ones, but it was it was interesting nonetheless. It's, it's still a topic. People, it's a topic people ask for a lot. And I mean, so. who doesn't love the guttural voices you hear for the first time? You know, straight from the depths of hell. Yeah. And an oblivion, it had like it has that kind of like echo yeah. to it. Yeah, mm. they well. chuck the it's reverb really cool. up real high on that one. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. All right, I think that's it. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. Social media links are in the description below. If you want to get some fudge muppet merch, you can get some in the description as well, and support the podcast. And we look forward to nerding out with you again very soon. We'll see you next year. <laughs>